from the National Hot Rod Association, Championship Drag Racing. The excitement on the racetrack at National Trail Raceway has attracted an overflow crowd to watch some of the greatest names in the sport of championship drag racing battle for the Spring Nationals Championship. The 16-car top fuel field is led by the quickest man in the history of drag racing, Gary Beck, with a qualifying time of 5.52 seconds. While the top fuel qualifying was predictable, the first round of racing in Funny Car Eliminator was anything but cut and dried. Kenny Bernstein was challenged by a virtual unknown on the national event circuit, Sherm Gunn of Azusa, California. For the past two seasons, Bernstein has been one of the hottest drivers ever. You saw him win the recent Gator Nationals here on Diamond P Sport. Bernstein's hopes for a Spring Nationals title went up in a cloud of tire smoke as Gunn pulled off one of the biggest upsets of the event. When the next pair of cars started their engines, everyone assumed the number one qualifier, Billy Meyer, the recent Cajun Nationals champ, would have an easy go. His competitor, John Force, has had more than his share of troubles with red lights, but Force put together a picture-perfect run while Meyer's performance was way off pace. Another surprise in round number one of Funny Car. Steve Evans talked with Force after his surprising upset. Anytime you can get around the hottest car on the circuit, the number one qualifier, Billy Meyer, John Force, you've got to be awfully pleased. I tell you, we we did it at uh, at Pomona. We got around Bernstein, number one qualifier. We did it at Gainesville, and then uh, Baton Rouge. I, I started getting that red light syndrome deal, and uh, enough that it even changed my car. Uh, last week at Bristol, the car wasn't running right. I found out that I was driving into the car and making it run different. The ETs fell way off. I told Frazier, I'm going back to beating that throttle. If I give him a red light, I'll take the embarrassment. Paid off here. It certainly did in big. Going into round two is John Ford. For the past 20 years, fans from throughout the United States and Canada have been coming to the NHRA Spring Nationals. This 1984 edition is no exception, with literally thousands of people jamming into the pit area and millions of dollars of exotic racing equipment on display, getting prepared for the next round of competition. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave McClellan, and we're at National Trail Raceway near Columbus, Ohio, one of the finest racing facilities anywhere in the United States. We're going to be picking up our Diamond Beast sports coverage today with the second round of competition and the action will be intense there's a lot of stories developing and to find out more let's join steve evans david i think that heat is going to play a big factor in the outcome of the spring nationals anytime you're dealing with 95 degrees and 60 percent humidity you, you look like this and the racetrack doesn't always give you its best shot either in fact you can ask kenny bernstein uh, superstar funny car racer who was beaten in the first round he'll tell you all about it you know, you'll notice on a cool day on a good racetrack, the rubber will stay flat and hard. I've been out there, and you can dig it up with your finger now. Well, yeah, Steve, you've been around, you've seen it, you know what it's like, and it's really tough up there. If you can do it with your, with your feet and your fingernails, like you say, imagine what a 3,000-horsepower engine can do to it if you don't have the right horsepower in the right spot. But well, at least Billy Meyer went out the same round. You needed that to happen. Well, it didn't hurt. Uh, it, you look at it two ways. It was good Billy went out. Nothing against Billy, of course, yeah. because it keeps us close together on the points chase for Winston. But obviously, on the other side, you look, well, if we'd won, we could have maybe got way ahead. <laughs> so with the two winningest cars of the season out of competition, Kenny Bernstein and Billy Meyer, let's look at the survivors around number one. You got to like Mark Oswald. If they don't overpower the racetrack, they could win it. But what about Don Perdome? There's a veteran that knows how to run in this heat and on a tricky racetrack. I like the Snakes' chances for a big comeback here today. Well, at least Top Fuel is running close to form. 
Gary Beck, the number one qualifier. He's the world champ, the world record holder. Joe Amato qualified number two. That was to be expected. The two have survived round one and appear to be headed for a final round confrontation. But uh, there's one guy here you might watch for, Gary Ormsby. He, too, has been number one qualifier twice this year, won the Winter Nationals, and pull him back a little bit. When he decides to tip his hand, could be quite a surpriser. Now, in pro style, if you'd asked me this morning, I'd have probably picked Bob Glidden. His new car that debuted at the Cajuns, running very smoothly. And on the starting line, what appeared to be a red light was really caused by a broken line lock that locks the front brakes to hold the car. Apparently a line broke, it lunged through, so he's out of competition. Warren Johnson, no one has his horsepower, but Warren, again, having his problems behind the wheel. A young guy named Gordy Rivera from Yuma, Arizona slapped a whole shot on Johnson. He will never forget. So now who do you look for? Lee Shepard. Bank on it. Thank you, Steve. The huge crowd in Columbus is ready for action in the second round of Top Fuel Eliminator. The crew for Doug Kerhoulis, bringing the 2,500 horsepower nitro-burning engine to life. These top fuel dragsters are the ultimate acceleration machines in the world of championship drag racing. Sleek and slender, cutting through the air with a minimum of effort, these cars are capable of speeds topping 260 miles an hour. The first pair of cars matches one of the true legends of drag racing, Chris the Golden Greek Caramacinis against Bakersfield, California's Doug Kerhoulis. While Kerhoulis has been competing on the National Event Trail for several years, his experience hardly matches the more than 25 years Caramacinis has spent racing these top fuel dragsters. Well, Doug, when you were about 12 years old, dreaming of being a pro drag racer, no one would have convinced you then someday you'd be racing a legend, the Greek. Oh, you're not kidding. Well, he's definitely a good friend of ours. I've been over there trying to rag on him pretty hard, trying to get him to mess up, but he's been driving too long, so it's going to be one of those uh, Joe Amato, Dick LaHaye races, I'm sure. By that, you mean very close. Very, very close. We stepped on the engine a little bit, and I'm sure Chris did, too. By stepping on the engine, Kerhoulis means he is tuning it for the maximum horsepower available. Both drivers are getting ready for the start. Karamasinis has been here hundreds of times before. His career dates back to the start of drag racing in the late 1950s, but he is still very competitive here in 1984. Both cars inching their way forward into the staging beam. A green light starts both cars away. Karamasinis going up in smoke, and Kerhoulis takes an easy win, but the wing breaks. As a parachute entangles itself in the broken wing, Kerhoulis trying to keep the car under control and upright, drives it straight into the catch nets at the end of the racetrack. The car remains upright, Kerhoulis in the roll cage. The catch nets doing their job, stopping the car. Karamasini's no problems, coasting to a slow stop and turning off the racetrack. But for Doug Kerhoulis, entwined in that catch net as the NHRA safety safari arrives on the scene, it's too early for any determination on Kerhoulis' condition. One thing is certain, the very best in emergency crew and equipment on hand at all NHRA national events. We'll have a report on Doug Kerhoulis when we return to the Spring Nationals. The Spring Nationals, we've been advised by the NHRA that Doug Kerhoulis is unconscious. As you can see, he is being loaded into the ambulance and will be transported to the hospital. Let's take a look again and see how this happened. At over 247 miles an hour, the wing collapses. The strut breaks, the wing falls down, and entangles in the parachute. At this point, Doug Kerhoulis is striving just to keep the car under control. You can see it move from the left-hand lane to the right-hand lane. Kerhoulis looking down into the cockpit, but as moments go by, he is rapidly running out of stopping distance. As he realizes he will not be able to bring the car under control, Kerhoulis takes dead aim on the bullseye on the first net. The car hits the net, goes through it, and into the second catch net, bringing the dragster to a stop from a speed of over 150 miles an hour. The double catch net system at the end of the racetrack, similar to the catch nets on an aircraft carrier, did their job perfectly, and that is to bring an out-of-control race car to a stop as it leaves the racing surface. Kerhoulis' car quickly brought to a halt. Kerhoulis still in the roll cage. The car intact did not overturn. However, Kerhoulis is unconscious and is being transported to the hospital. We hope to bring you an update 
on his condition very shortly. Back at the starting line, our next pair of cars in round number two of competition, their engines running, ready to do the burnout. In the near lane is Tony Coletta from Ypsilanti, Michigan. In the far lane, the man that qualified number one and is the quickest man in all of drag racing history, Gary Beck. You recently saw Gary defeat his car owner, Larry Miner, in the finals of the Cajun Nationals, and you watched all that action right here on Diamond P Sports. Here in round number two at the Spring Nationals, it is Gary Beck calling Hemet, California home against one of the true veterans, Connie Coletta from Ypsilanti, Michigan. Coletta had his share of problems here at the Spring Nationals. Earlier in top fuel qualifying, Coletta tried to bring his car to a stop after his parachute failed. He was unable to do so, and Coletta had his confrontation with the catch net. The damage to the car was not severe. He was able to repair it and return to competition, defeating Hank Endres in round number one of racing. Now, in round number two, he is matched against the number one qualifier, Gary Beck. Coletta, all the pre-race procedures completed, the face mask down, the gloves on tight, both drivers approaching the starting line and concentrating ever so intently on that all-important start. Gary Beck in the far lane. Connie Coletta in the near lane and a red light for Connie Coletta, an instant win for Gary Beck. That's a disqualification for Coletta. He left the starting line too soon, but Gary Beck taking the win and advancing now to the semifinals of Top Fuel Racing. As we watch again, you can see ever so slightly Coletta's car moving before Beck, but he moved just before the tree went green and lost the race. Now, any time you race Gary Beck, you better try to get off the starting line first. Connie Coletta tried to do that and ended up at the foul start. The electronic system caught him, Gary, and uh, you've won it at 569. Yeah, well, we're trying to hang on to the track. You know, it's a little tricky and trying to be careful, trying to stay out of that net. So, but it's, uh, no, it's fortunate. I, uh, Coletta leaves early. I'm sure he was trying to cut it real fine. You see you're trying to get a hold of the track. Are you running safe? Is that what you're saying? You back up a little bit? We've been real careful with the clutch. We're trying to keep the power in to be able to get an ET, but we're being real careful with what we do with the clutch. Okay, so being very cautious and... Uh, Wisely so. Gary Beck goes into the semifinals. Steve, Gary is showing the same concern as all the racers over the extreme amount of heat and humidity here in Columbus. This is Bob Simmons. You seldom see him on the national event trail, but here he is at round number two racing, but he's got a tough one to race against. The fastest man in all of drag racing, Joe Amato. Simmons, basing his racing operation in Rockville, Connecticut, is one of the fine East Coast top fuel racers. While Joe Amato, also from the East Coast, Old Forge, Pennsylvania, his home base, is the fastest man in the sport, setting a new NHRA speed record of over 263 miles an hour earlier this season with this revolutionary new car. The burnouts are completed and both drivers are set. Bob Simmons in the near lane, Joe Amato in the far lane. And it is Amato out first. He continues to extend his lead through the middle of the racetrack and at the finish line, an easy victory for Joe Amato. 5.73 seconds, his speed 252 miles an hour. Amato advances into the semifinal round of the Spring Nationals Championship. He will race the winner of our next pair of cars, Shirley Muldowney against Gary Ormsby. For Muldowney, the Columbus Racetrack National Trail Raceway, the scene of her greatest triumphs. Four times she has won the Top Fuel title, dating back to 1976, when Shirley Muldowney became the first woman ever to win a professional racing title for NHRA-style racing. Gary Ormsby from Roseville, California. As we heard Steve Evans say, he is one to watch. Ormsby qualified in the number four spot, Shirley in the number eight qualifying position, but she has to be the sentimental and crowd favorite. She won this event in 1976, in 1977, in 80 and 82, and as we said, was runner-up last season. And regardless of qualifying position, she has to be considered a favorite here on her favorite racetrack, National Trail. But Gary Ormsby wants to be the stopper. He is in the thick of things in the World Championship points chase at the moment. 
Ormsby, a car dealer in Northern California, has mounted a serious chase for those world championship points, traveling to all NHRA national events. Shirley Baldani has won that world champion title an unprecedented three times. The winner of this race to face Joe Amato, the number two qualifier in the semifinal. Both drivers into the staging beam. And it's a green light start, and it's an even start off the line, but it is Gary Ormsby beginning to pull away. And by just a little over a car length, Gary Ormsby wins the race 5.65 seconds. His speed, 247 miles an hour. Shirley Muldowney will not be in the winner's circle at the Spring Nationals this year. Let's look again. You can see they leave the starting line almost side by side, very evenly matched at that point. But the power in Ormsby's car begins to come on. He stretches his lead and wins the race. She ran a pretty good number against you. She stepped right up with the 74 that you got her in the 60s. Yeah, she's no lightweight. That's she ain't easy to beat. <laughs> I know. Even now, after all these years, if she beats you, you go back to Sacramento, and your old friends will still give you a hard time about it. Oh, there's a lot of heat, Steve. <laughs> a lot of heat. That lady beats you. <laughs> and especially if she leaves on you, which she didn't. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> but that's, nothing's worse than getting beat by her. And it's not because that she's not a good racer it's just people don't understand you know she's a lady and she's a very good racer oh i'll say she is you got another very good racer coming up next round joe amato yeah we went battle uh, several races and he's pretty tough but i think we'll be ready this time hopefully okay we'll see gary ormsby in the semis gary ormsby the winner over shirley muldowney moving into the semi-finals to face joe amato for gary beck it will be an easy run in the semis doug kerhulis out of competition gary beck gets the bye the 1984 Spring Nationals is being brought to you by Budweiser. This way in the NHRA Spring Nationals, I'm Dave McClellan along with Steve Evans, and it's time for Funny Cars Second Round. Earlier, you saw this man, John Force, defeat the number one qualifier, Billy Meyer. This round, he has to race the four-time world champion, Don Prudhomme, who defeated Paul Smith in round number one with an outstanding 5.87 second elapsed time. Based on performance and qualifying time, John Force has got to be considered the underdog. But Don Prudhomme has been having his problems as of late. He hopes they are cured at this spring national. Prudhomme has won this event three times, but he has not been in the winner's circle since 1978. For John Force, he has yet to win a major NHRA championship event. He hopes this Spring Nationals will be his chance for the victory. For Prudhomme driving the Trans Am bodied car in the far lane, he has seen John Force already defeat the number one qualifier. Both cars creeping into those staging beams when all four yellow bulbs are lit at the top of that Christmas tree. It indicates the cars are ready. And they're off the line. Something going wrong with John Force's car. And Don Prudhomme on an easy go runs 5.99 seconds, but way down on speed. In the first round, he went 247 miles an hour. Here, only two. 212. The huge crowd watching intently towards the starting line is our next pair of cars doing their burnout. In the near lane is the reigning world champion. This is Frank Hawley driving the Chi Town Hustler. Across from him, the man they call the mongoose, Tom McEwen. Frank Hawley from London, Ontario, Canada, has won two consecutive world champion funny car titles. For Tom McEwen, more than two decades in the sport of drag racing, from his home in Fountain Valley, California, driving practically every type of drag racing vehicle known, McEwen currently at the wheel of the late model Corvette bodied funny car. McEwen, along with his ex-partner Don Prudhomme, made one of the most famous teams in all of drag racing, that of the snake and the mongoose. Speaking of the snake, let's go to Steve Evans. He's with Don Prudhomme. Well, in this sport, the wind lights uh, make you smile, but when there's rounds to go, the 599s don't. Snake, uh, what happened? Do you have any idea? Yeah, I think so. It just fell off. We made a jet change, and tracks were loose in the middle, and it used the engine up during the uh, three-quarter mark of the course. So, you know, it just slowed up. All right, so Don Prudhomme goes to the semifinals, and uh, at least he thinks he knows how to get back into that 580 track. It's still open. 
a subdued Don Prudhomme, but leaving him laughing as his crew gets ready to go back to the pits to prepare for the semifinals of Funny Car. Back on the starting line, it's anything but subdued as the reigning world champion, Frank Hawley, in the near lane against Tom McEwen in the far lane. Thus far this season, Hawley has not had a particularly good year. He is far down the points list in that chase for the world championship, and it is McEwen off the line first, and he continues to pull away. McEwen with some outstanding performances, 5.92 seconds. His speed, 249 miles an hour for the Mongoose. Two parachutes out on both cars as they both slow to an easy stop and will make the turnoff. Tom McEwen advancing now into the semifinal round. Our next pair, the defending Spring Nationals champion, Raymond Beetle in the far lane, in the near lane, the man with the upset as the body comes down in his car. In round number one, you saw him defeat Kenny Bernstein. This is the chassis builder from Azusa, California, Sherm Gunn. Formerly driving an alcohol-burning funny car, Sherm moved up to the Nitro category a couple of years ago. This Spring Nationals, the best performance of his career thus far. Let's go to Steve with Tom McEwen. All right, a big smile from Tom the Mongoose McEwen, but uh, first of all, there was a complaint about shake. Yeah, it shook real bad in the middle. I think the track is uh, right on the edge there, and you got to kind of really walk the, the plank out there and try to get off the start line and not get loose in the middle of the track. And that can be an advantage to a guy with your experience and the snake guys like you that have been around a while well i hope so i'd like to i'd like to think that uh, we're trying to have a little game plan here we're going to run them one at a time and i kind of wanted to try to get lane choice i saw Perdomo run 99 ahead of me so i'd like to get him off the lane he's been running all day because he's running a lot better and you know what he can do i think he just got lane choice thank you sir Tom McEwen moving to the semifinals. This pair of cars pitch Sherm Gunn, the underdog from Azusa, California, against the man that is a three-time world champion, and he is the defending champion at the Spring Nationals, the Blue Max himself, Raymond Beetle from Dallas, Texas. You know, in spite of the exotic developments on these race cars, one of the more basic pieces of equipment is the driver's headgear. Whoa! The nitro fumes can get pretty intense, even in the pit area when they're just warming up the cars. And you know, back in the early 50s, the first fellow to run nitro was a guy named Fran Hernandez. And there was no way Fran could uh, keep it a secret, <laughs> for obvious reasons. And along about the early 60s, when the drivers were becoming nauseous from the fumes, the breather mask was conceived. A filtered mask made the driver a good deal more comfortable. And even today, Raymond Beetle still uses this trusty device, along with his old, rather battered, full-coverage helmet. But here right now is the latest technology in helmets. In fact, Mark Oswald of the Candies and Hughes team just got this helmet yesterday. The breathers are built into it, and it has a fireproof Nomex sock made out of carbon fiber. The entire helmet weighs less than two pounds. And also brand new on this helmet is the double layer goggles. In case of fire, this top layer can burn off and still the driver will have some vision with that second layer. You'll see motocross riders even using these helmets today without the sock to filter out the dust and the dirt. So even uh, in the helmet department, the technology marches on. Thank you, Steve. And technology is what is approaching the starting line. The ultimate state-of-the-art, full-bodied, fastest accelerating cars in the world. These are the nitro-burning funny cars of championship drag racing. Sherm Gunn in the near lane. Raymond Beetle, the defending champion in the far lane. This is round number two at the Spring Nationals. The winner here advances into the semifinals and can Gunn do it again. It is Raymond Beetle, though, pulling away at the final. And it is Raymond Beetle winning it. 5.93 seconds, over 247 miles an hour at the end of the quarter-mile racing surface. So the Mustang-bodied car of Beetle continues its march, hopefully for him, he says, for his second Spring National title in a row. This is Gary Southern driving the car owned by Bill Dunlap. He's racing against Mark Oswald, driving for the team of Candies in Hughes. Oswald, out of Cincinnati, Ohio, holds the speed record for funny cars at this event at over 259 miles an hour. Southern, with experience in all types of race car, considered one to watch. Both cars into those staging beams preparatory to the race. Oswald against Southern, and Oswald off the starting mark first. He builds an insurmountable lead and takes the 
win with no elapsed time of the round, 5.85 seconds. That win moves Oswald into the semifinals to race the defending champion Raymond Beetle, the other pairing, the Snake versus the Mongoose. Let's go down to Prudhomme's pit area and check in with Steve. This is so much of a guessing game. The car goes a little slower that round. You come back here with your mechanic, Bob Brandy, and you really start guessing a lot. You really do. Uh, you, you guess way before you get back to the pit, Steve. Uh, you know, you guess, uh, uh, you know, as the thing was going into high gear, I, I knew it was wrong with it. And, and you know, I had to make some uh, quick decisions on what to do uh, on our way back to the pits here. We discuss things like that uh, in the tow vehicle. And we get back here, we pretty much know what to do. Well, we look forward to watching any time you and Tom get together. It's always fun. It'd be a good race. Action picking up in the top fuel pits as the crew preparing Joe Amato's car for the semi-final round of racing. We'll be coming right back to the Spring Nationals. Don't go away. Racers are getting set for more action, but before we go back to racing, let's check in on the story of Doug Kerhoulis. Steve Evans has the information. Ronnie Davis is the emergency medical technician on NHRA's safety safari. And Ronnie, could you give us a report on Doug Kerhoulis? We just got back from the hospital. He's in fair condition. He's uh, stable condition. He's got good pulse, good respiration. Uh, they're going to transfer him to Riverside Hospital in Columbus for further evaluation. But when we left, uh, all the vitals were stable and in good condition. Thank you, Ronnie. We'll check with you later. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Steve. And we'll keep tabs on that story. Here at the Spring Nationals, in addition to the professional categories of racing that we have been covering, there has been sportsman competition. In the top fuel motorcycle category, Elmer Tratt from Demarest, Georgia, rode his Kawasaki to a victory over George Bryce III at an elapsed time of 7.37 seconds. In stock eliminator, Alan Peters of Stratford, Connecticut, driving the Camaro, matched up against Tom Ward from Grand Island, Florida, driving the Plymouth Fury station wagon. At the finish line, it is Alan Peters, the winner, of Stock Eliminator. In Superstock from Matuchin, New Jersey, Mark Osterby driving a 69 Camaro against Eddie Moranian from Washington, D.C. in a pair of East Coast-based Camaros. At the finish line, Mark Osterby, the New Jersey car, coming out the victor and taking home the Spring National Superstock title. In Super Gas Eliminator, Mark Dannenbaum from Scranton, Pennsylvania raced Kevin Dodrow from Johnston, Ohio. A Camaro against a Model T Roadster, and it was the Camaro of Mark Donenbaum declared the winner at 9.86 seconds. In competition eliminator, a Roadster against a Dragster, Joe Santangelo from Hartford, Connecticut, against Tim Cole in the Dragster, the big lead and the win to Joe Santangelo in competition eliminator. In the alcohol funny car categories, it was Vern Most from West Des Moines, Iowa, defeating Dick Bell from Nashua, New Hampshire. The time, 6.57 seconds at 212 miles an hour, and the victory for Vern Most. In top alcohol, Dragster winning another NHRA national event crown. Don Woosley from Winchester, Kentucky, defeated John Samalek, his Linden, New Jersey-based car, coming in second. Don Woosley, the top alcohol dragster champion. Our congratulations going to all the Sportsman Eliminator champions here at the 20th annual running of the NHRA Spring Nationals. Let's go now to the starting line for the semi-final round of Pro Stock Eliminator. In the far lane, it is Gene Fashing. Fashing is the man that took advantage of Bob Glidden in the second round of racing when the defending champion had his problems and red-lighted. In the near lane, the Pontiac of Mark and Brad Ewell, the Ewell brothers. Driving at this event is Brad Ewell from Reno, Nevada. From the state of Minnesota comes Gene Fashing. He's in the semifinal round of Pro Stock, one of his better days at this Spring Nationals event. Both cars powered by 500 cubic inch engines running on gasoline using carburetors and a red light start for Fashing. Brad Ewell takes the win, and ironic that it is, in the same lane just one round later, Gene Fashing.
flashing red lights just as his competition, the defending champion Bob Glidden, did in the previous round. But for Brad Ewell, he is in the finals with his Pontiac as Fashing goes through and takes the early turnoff and goes back to the pits. It'll be Brad Ewell against one of these two cars. Gordy Rivera in the near lane, the reigning world champion, Lee Shepard in the far lane. For Gordy Rivera, one of his best days. He qualified very well and put a tremendous hole shot on Warren Johnson to win his second round race. The Yuma, Arizona driver has got his work cut out for him, though, as Lee Shepard, the reigning world champion, the man you saw just win a Cajun national title right here on Diamond P Sports just a few weeks ago, is on a roll, and his Chevy Camaro has got the horsepower to put him in the winner's circle. We've seen that already this season. Rivera surprised his fellow competitors and spectators alike. When he qualified in the number five spot with a 779, he'll need all of that, though, in competition against the world champion. They leave the starting line out. Red lights start for Gordy Rivera. It is Lee Shepard into the finals against Brad Ewell. The Pro Stock Finals at the Spring National, 7.75 seconds at over 176 miles an hour. Shepard versus Ewell in the finals at Columbus, Ohio. We'll be coming right back with Top Fuel Eliminators. They're getting set. Don't you miss a moment at the Spring National. Round of Top Fuel Eliminator at the Spring Nationals matches Joe Amato against Gary Ormsby. Two of the finest cars in competition today. Amato, with the assistance of his lovely wife, Jerry, who's out to back him up into his own track, has been concentrating on speed. He holds the record over 263 miles an hour, but he gives a lot of tribute to his wife, Jerry. No one should know better the feelings and the temperature of Joe Amato going into the final rounds and his wife, Jerry, who is so very close to him. How's he doing? How's he feeling? He's doing great, and he's feeling okay. <laughs> now, you guys are contesting for this world championship. You're leading the points, and every round becomes critical. Right. This one is very critical because we know Ormsby can step up a little more. He's got more left. I don't think I've ever met a husband and wife that are as close as you and Joe are. You travel together. You seem to spend an awful lot of time together. We really do. We enjoy it. I like it just as much as he does, and I help him with the car, mix the fuel, pack the parachute, and a few other details. So I think that makes for a happy family. Jerry Amato, a vital part of Joe Amato's racing operation. You could not ask for two more closely matched cars in this semifinal round. Jerry Ormsby in the far lane. Joe and Ormsby up in smoke. Joe Amato pulls away. And at the finish line, it is an easy win. A happy Jerry Amato as Joe moves into the finals. The elapsed time for Joe Amato, 5.63 seconds. His speed over 255 miles an hour. That new car that he debuted early this season working to perfection. Both cars just clawing for traction as they come off the starting line. But Gary Ormsby overpowers the tires, and they go up in smoke. A hug for driver Joe from wife Jerry, and then starts the hard work to get ready for the finals. They'll be racing this man, Gary Beck. He has a bye run. You remember, Doug Gerhulis had problems, went into the net at the end of the racetrack. He was to have been the competition for Gary Beck. Starter Buster Couch looking over the car, making sure everything is all right with both driver and engine. As to Doug Gerhulis, we've had no further word on his condition. Gary Beck is faced with a choice at this point. Does he run the car hard, or does he take it easy to save parts? If he runs it hard and sets a quicker elapsed time than Amato, he will have lane choice. A flip of the switch, the trees green, and it is a thundering pass for Gary Beck. There it is, low elapsed time of the meet. 5.49 seconds, his speed over 258 miles an hour. Gary Beck into the finals against Joe Amato with the lane choice at the Spring National. Meantime, on the starting line, experience prevails. The four-time world champion, Don Prudhomme, is racing his former partner in that old wildlife racing team, Tom McEwen. Those are the days that Don Prudhomme was called a snake, and Tom McEwen was known as the mongoose, and they battled it out on racetracks all across the country. At the Spring Nationals in the semifinals, it is once again Don Prudhomme against Tom McEwen. The winner of this race will have the chance to contest test for the championship. Prudhomme has won this race three times, but he's not been there since 1978. Tom McEwen has yet to take a Spring Nationals title. 
the emergency hatch being closed opened up to let a little air in in this very hot, muggy, humid day at National Trail Raceway. The Corvette-bodied car of Tom McEwen in the far lane, the Pontiac Trans Am-bodied car of Don Prudhomme in the near lane. These two veteran drivers concentrating on that start. It's all important, and up in smoke goes Prudhomme, and McEwen just streaks for the finish line on one of his best runs ever, 5.87 for 251 miles an hour. That advances McEwen into the finals, and a great disappointment for Don Prudhomme. As we watch again, you can see exactly how it took place. They come off the starting line together, and almost instantaneously, Prudhomme's Pontiac losing traction way too much power those big wide slicks just can't hold the power getting congratulations from his crew tom McEwen with a smile on his face and a nod to the onlookers as he has earned the right to face one of these two drivers in the finals of funny car it will be either raymond beetle the defending champion or mark oswald in the far lane driving the pontiac trans am of candies and hughes Oswald has already been over 259 miles an hour on this racetrack. For Raymond Beadle, he would like nothing better than to get back into the pattern of winning. He is a three-time world champion. Oswald last season finishing number two in the world. Both drivers are set. The tree is green as Oswald off first. A big lead for Oswald off the starting line, and he continues to extend it at the finish. And it is Mark Oswald at speed only 242 miles an hour. But that sets up our finals. It will be Tom McEwen against Mark Oswald as we watch in replay. You see how it was won for the Candies and Hughes team. The lead being extended from the very beginning of the race for Mark Oswald over the defending champion Raymond Beadle and the Blue Max just a couple of car lengths back at the finish. But that was enough. Well, Mark uh, got a little lucky there. Beadle was closing fast. Yeah, it was close. I, you know, when I was driving the chute, I had a little trouble getting stopped the last two times. Yeah, it looked like you shut off before he did. Yeah, I clicked it a little early. We've been kind of wounding the motor a little bit, and I want to save it as much as possible. I, I felt that I was ahead, so I clicked it. We just learned that you've lost lane choice by two thousandths of a second to Tom McEwen in the final. Well, it's not too big a deal. This racetrack's held up real good. I think we can make a good run in the left lane. All right, go get him. <laughs> Mark Oswald, confident of his chances in the funny car final when he will be racing Tom McEwen at the Spring National. You be sure to stick around champion Lee Shepard driving the rare and Morrison Camaro from Dallas Texas checking over to coordinate his burnout activities with his competition Brad Ewell at the wheel of the Ewell Brothers Pontiac Trans Am Firebird this is the final for pro stock eliminator at the spring nationals for Lee Shepard he's been in that winner's circle many times before but for Brad Ewell this is a rare experience making it to the finals the absolutely gorgeous Pontiac powered by that 500 cubic engine and for Ewell he's got to concentrate not only on his own driving skills but he's got to think what does Lee Shepard have in his bag of tricks for me this race both cars coming into those staging beams the final run for pro stock champion and it's Lee Shepard out in front off the starting line Shepard continues to pull away and he takes that rare and Morrison Camaro across the finish line first to take the Spring Nationals Championship. For the Ewell brothers out of Reno, Nevada, Brother Mark Ewell says, nice job, Brad. We'll do it again another day. But for Lee Shepard, as we watch again, this is the first time ever in all of his career that he has won a Spring Nationals Championship. He did it with a great driving job and the power of that rare and Morrison Camaro to take him to a multi-car link victory over the team of Mark and Brad Ewell in their Pontiac Trans Am. So Lee Shepard winning the Pro Stock title at the Spring Nationals. Back at the starting line, the final pair of funny cars. Their engines already burning, their burnouts halfway completed, and Mark Oswald has the near lane. The lane choice went to the Corvette of Tom McEwen by, as you heard in that interview just a few moments ago, just a couple of thousands of a second. It may be all important to the outcome of this final. For Mark Oswald, he has got top speed for funny cars at this event, 259 miles an hour indicating tremendous amounts of horsepower on tap in that Candies and Hughes machine. For Tom McEwen, a 5.87 second elapsed time indicates he is as competitive as he has ever been in his more than 20 years of drag racing.
McEwen against Oswald, the final for the Funny Car Championship. All eyes directed towards the starting line. Buster Couch and his crew checking everything over, making sure it is perfect before the cars leave the line. And it is McEwen up in smoke. He had the lane choice, and he is the one that lost traction for Oswald, the Spring Nationals Championship. The elated Candies in Hughes' crew looks on the scoreboard and sees a 5.90, 251-mile-an-hour charge to take home the championship. In replay, you can see the tire smoke coming out from beneath the Tom McEwen Corvette, and that lost him the race. For Oswald, it was like he was glued to the racetrack as he streaked for the finish line. So Mark Oswald avenges a final round loss here a year ago to Raymond Beadle to pick up his third NHRA title. One of only two drivers to have ever won NHRA national events in top fuel and funny car. Don Perdome being the other one. Congratulations, Spring Nationals champion. Thank you, Steve. I didn't think we'd ever get one this year. <laughs> I don't know what happened to McEwen, but he was out of it early. Yeah, I don't know. I never really saw him at all. I don't know if he had a problem smoking the tires or what. Well, it looks like you went up a little conservative, a 590 lap time. Cardinal Paul Candies giving the high five to Mark. Uh, what, how did you set it up? Well, we just tried to get down the track again. We, we've been trying to compensate in the final rounds, and we've been losing. You know, we've been trying to keep making it go quicker, and we decided to just go with it the same and try to win the race. And you have certainly now matured as a funny car driver. No one can call this kid a rookie anymore. Paul Candies, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Fine young man. Yeah. My guys did a great job. Best team in drag racing. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than this. Well, it certainly does. And they also leave here with the lead towards a potential world championship. Mark Oswald getting a big hug from wife Janie. He's the Spring Nationals champion. Joe Amato getting backed up by his wife, Jerry Amato, and she tells him exactly where to put that race car into those tracks left by the burnout. Joe Amato against the quickest car in the sport and certainly the quickest car here today. This is Gary Beck driving for car owner Larry Miner. This is the final in Top Fuel Eliminator. The final two cars to go down this racetrack today. It will all be decided on this final run. For Gary Beck, he established low elapsed time of this meet in the semifinal round. That gave him the lane choice. Joe Amato now has to worry about will he lose traction. But for Gary Beck, he just saw Tom McEwen lose traction right in front of him in the funny car final. It is not only a battle of skill, it is a battle of preparation and also a psychological war as they come into those staging beams. The top fuel final, Gary Beck in the far lane, in the near lane, Joe Amato. director of NHRA and Gary Beck consistent at 5.54 seconds wins the Spring National Championship over Joe Amato. Great racing here on this quarter mile surface at National Trail Raceway as Beck pulls away in the middle of the course he continues to extend his lead and by the time that he gets to the end of that quarter mile racetrack he has defeated Joe Amato. So Gary Beck makes it two big wins in a row. The Cajun Nationals just a few weeks ago, and now the Spring Nationals again for Gary Beck. Congratulations, my friend. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, geez, it's a tough race. You know, anytime you race Joe Amato, it's a handful, and uh, real happy to win, and that's for sure. Well, even if he can't win, he seems to hang around a few more rounds than you'd like. Oh, yeah, no, they got a great race team over there, and uh, super, super guys, and certainly... Uh, we're real happy for the light all-stars and be able to get her in the winner's circle two times in a row. And you just hold your breath all the way down the racetrack, hoping those tires stay stuck. That's it. I saw some wheels on over there right off the starting line, and then I, I rung her out a little bit in low gear, and they went away. I was real happy to see that. Well, here comes the station wagon full of some big, burly guys from Hemet, California, and they are mighty, mighty happy. Gary Beck receiving congratulations from Joe Amato and his crew, and our congratulations to all the professional champions, Gary Beck, Mark Oswald, and Lee Shepard. We'll be coming right back with something special here at the Spring National. The final car down the racing surface at the Spring Nationals Championship is this jet-powered Odyssey Dragster driven by Aggie Hendricks, one of the fastest women drivers in the world. Aggie Hendricks bringing up the RPMs and doing what's known as the burner pops on this jet dragster, the afterburner kicking in. Nodding to the starter, she's ready and blasting off. Come out at over 260.
56 miles an hour. An impressive run by Aggie Hendricks. I'm Dave McClellan for Steve Evans saying so long from...